Um, hello everyone, um, I'm Nick and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about using React in combination with uh, Redux. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, uh, yeah, I said I'm, I'm Nick. Uh, you can email me at nick at nickcraft.com. Um, I'm a creator of uh, the UI library, React UI library, Bell. It has over a thousand stars on GitHub and it's a little bit popular right now. It's pretty good. I really like it. Enjoy it. Uh, I'm working with a freelancer community called Star Squad. Uh, what we do there is we form teams to help startups and work on, on science projects. Uh, it's completely remote and that also gave me the opportunity to travel a lot. So this year I was uh, traveling around the world on uh, one trip, seven months. Um, it's really a lot of fun. Yeah, um, first up, uh, a warning. Uh, what I'm in my code examples here, I'm using ECMAScript 2015. Um, so, what you see up here on the screen, that's actually valid JavaScript um, in the latest uh, approved version. Um, just to clarify, that's a function definition. Uh, we basically allow to, to create the sum of the first and second argument and we return the result. Uh, and I will use that a lot because it's just way shorter and um, way nicer to, to uh, highlight code. Uh, you might ask yourself uh, how the hell how can you use that? I mean, that maybe runs in Chrome, but for sure not in i9 or 10. Um, what we use is uh, we use Babel. It's a JavaScript compiler, a transpiler. Um, it was created by Sebastian McKinsey, uh, who now works for Facebook. Um, started, he started the project actually uh, when he was 18 or 17, I'm not sure, in, in fall 2000, uh, uh, 2014. And it allows us to uh, compile the newest version of JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript 2015, uh, down to uh, to ECMAScript 5, which you have in, in i9, you have in uh, IE10, and so on and so forth, and Firefox and, and you name it. This is all the browsers uh, that people use nowadays. And you might ask yourself, well, not yet another compiler, uh, but the thing is, Babel is really widely adopted. So Facebook, um, in August, Facebook switched to, to use Babel, so the whole Facebook uh, a code that you that you see or that that exists, the JavaScript code is compiled with Babel. Um, you have companies uh, net, like Netflix, Mozilla, Airbnb, uh, Paper, Reddit, Spotify, Lesson, uh, you name it. All of them using Babel nowadays. Um, so yeah, that's the the brief warning. Um, <coughs> let me get started first with a few questions. Um, Please raise your hand if you ever have built something with React. Yay, cool, couple of people. Um, second question, do you intend to build your next project with React? Okay, a couple more, that seems good. Uh, then let's get right into it. Uh, what is React? React is a JavaScript li uh, library for building user interfaces. It's not more than that, it's not a framework, it doesn't provide you with routing, it doesn't provide you with data fetching uh, strategies, it's just UI rendering. And it has uh, something what we call a one-way reactive data flow. Um, so if you use, if you're familiar with, with Polymer or Angular um, or even Ember, what you see there a lot is that you have two-way data binding and React is actually going the complete the other way and telling you uh, we don't have that, uh, we don't uh, change state by default by binding something to, to your DOM. Um, but React has the virtual DOM. And um, I will go into that in a minute, but when you look at this, okay, one-way data binding, focus on UI, and you basically tell me it's a template language. Um, and it actually is something like that, not much more, <laughs> with a couple of nice extras, um, but yeah. Think about it as, as React, uh, it's just your, your template thing. Okay, uh, the virtual DOM. 
that's the whole magic thing why React is better than uh, really great than, than, uh, um, and so popular right now. Uh, and the virtual DOM uh, keeps, uh, our, let's first go into the problem definition why, why uh, we have the virtual DOM is um, keeping state, um, keeping track of state in DOM is, is really, really hard. Um, and until now, or until like a few years back, this was basically the back best practice. If you look at uh, jQuery components, you have a lot of data actually bound in the DOM. If you look at the date picker, uh, for example, a jQuery date picker, you have a lot of information in the DOM as data attributes. And that is, that is kind of problematic, because then you always have to ask the DOM uh, if I want to get information, uh, I asked the DOM if when you click on, on a button or you click on a date in a date picker, the date itself has it as a data attribute and then you pass it again to your code and it's kind of uh, weird because we store data in our DOM. Um, why do we do that? Because the DOM is just slow. It's really annoying. You you, uh, you don't want to, until now it was really hard to, to Think about uh, a strategy where you have like you have your data and then you just map it to your your rendering and you re-render the whole thing. That was not possible because you, I mean, it was possible, but it was just damn slow and nobody did it. That was the reason. And then some guys from Facebook came up with this idea: hmm, why don't we create something like a virtual DOM, which is just way way faster, and we take care of the rendering, and that's what the virtual DOM is. Because what you can do here is you have your model. Oh, let me use this. Here. Um, you basically have your data model, and then what the virtual DOM does, it creates a representation um, of your HTML. Uh, it actually doesn't have to be HTML, but I'll go back to that. Um, and then in the end, it renders it to the real DOM. What's the benefit here? The benefit is that uh, what you can do is you can have your data model, you update your data model, and React will take care of identifying what actually changed in the representation, in the rendering, and then do only the updates that are needed to the, to the real DOM. So what you can do then is, you basically connect your, um, your representation to your data, and then you don't care about it anymore, because React takes care of that, it abstracts the whole thing away. Uh, the benefit is definitely that you have uh, batch DOM read and write operations, so it becomes really, really fast if you change a lot. Um, and it will only change uh, whatever is really needed to change. So you can, if you add two elements to a list, uh, and you dump the whole list again to, uh, uh, to, to your rendering strategy, or, or to your rendering, and then React will identify Oh, there are only two new elements. I only will manipulate these two elements in the real DOM. And you don't have to care about it. You only care about the communication and how you, how you do rendering with the virtual DOM, but you never interact with the real DOM. I mean, you still can, but it will mess up things. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the virtual DOM, and that's, that's the, the idea behind it is um, that we can uh, have a way say, or we, it's way saner to actually only think about your data model and then how you, how you connect it to your UI uh, compared to actually having data in the DOM and in your data model and then um, uh, fiddling between them. So let's get right into it. Um, our first experiment, uh, let's uh, create um, such an, uh, let's create HTML with React. Uh, here we have an index, HTML, nothing fancy. Uh, I, the things I want to highlight are always my uh, old. So in this case, you see a script tag. Um, it's bundle.js. That's the outcome of our compiled um, JavaScript code. And then what's also important that here, we have an, an diff with an IP example that we will need uh, to let React know where it actually should render um, our HTML. So what you can see here is, that's our JavaScript file. And that's, uh, I called it main.js, but in the end, when we compile it, it will be uh, bundle 
JS, and that's the same thing that we saw in the in the Emacs HTML. Uh, what you can see here is pretty straightforward import. Um, ECMAScript 6 again, so just in case you haven't seen that, that's normal nowadays that you can do imports like that in JavaScript. Um, and here we simply get the, the example element we have seen before, and then we take uh, a library called React DOM, which is uh, part of, of or built by the, by the React core team. And we use this library to render our uh, virtual DOM, which is here. It's a headline with, with uh, Hello World in it, um, simply into this element. And um, you might have two remarks here. Uh, <coughs> first of all, why, why do you need React DOM? Why is it not part of React? Uh, the reason uh, here is that it actually was at some point, but nowadays uh, React is moving forward, uh, and what we see is that uh, there are different rendering targets. So now, at least you can have React Canvas, or you maybe heard of React Native. Uh, so you write components, and it will render native iOS or Android uh, components. And that's pretty neat because you can simply use JavaScript in your application code and it will render native iOS components. Uh, the second thing, or the second remark you might have is like, what the heck are you doing? You're writing HTML in JavaScript code? How is that possible? Um, because that's actually not valid. <laughs> um, how it works is, uh, it's not fully it's ECMAScript 6 plus JSX, and JSX is, um, is an XML-like syntax, and we leverage both. So we use JSX in combination with uh, ECMAScript 6 here. So what you can do with JSX is, it's just for convenience, uh, it allows you to, to write HTML tags, or uh, this JSX tags, uh, right away in your JavaScript code. Um, and to understand what's actually happening, of course we, we don't have that in our, our compiled code. What's actually happening is it will compile to React create element, it creates this element, and then uh, the parameters or the, the attributes you have on the, on the tag um, uh, goes parameters for, uh, for your component. Um, there's, there's one remark, or what do you have to think about? Uh, you probably learned if you if you're doing development since like in the past ten years, you probably heard multiple times never uh, mix your uh, JavaScript code with uh, your HTML. Um, I think that's valid for very for a lot of cases, um, but not in this community. It's actually it's you have this. <laughs> It was kind of a joke when they first presented it. Um, people in the audience said like, yeah, yeah you're re reinventing uh, best practices. And they, they took that as a slogan, for real. Like, guys, we do that, yeah. <laughs> and that's so, um, when you consider uh, don't write HTML in a JavaScript code, um, for a lot of teams, that's not valid anymore. All right, uh, so if you go back, um, that works pretty well, and what you have is in your if ID example, we will simply render the H1. That's the whole magic behind part. That, that's the basic API to, to render something. Um, all right, so that, that's the, the thing, the most basic thing you know, you have to know, and then you're, you're pretty good to go. Uh, of course, that's not the, the real thing why, why React is becoming so popular. Why, uh, the great thing about React. Uh, the great thing about React is that you can create components um, and you can reuse these components. And uh, for demonstration purposes, we create a, uh, here. Uh, we do the same thing as before, uh, except we don't render a headline, we render a paragraph tag in this case, but we wrap it in a function definition. So here we create our app. Const, but uh, yeah, I'm using const. Previously, you used var. Nowadays, you use let and const, and uh, that's just like a, a, a single assignment construct. So you can um, you cannot reassign app, but uh, um, we use that now. So const is is 
uh, defines this variable f, which cannot be reassigned, but it will be assigned one at least once, and that we that we apply in the function uh, head row. By the way, if you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, shout out, and uh, I'm happy to explain. And um, if you compare it to before, uh, when we had this, here we rendered the hello world uh, directly uh, into this, but in this case we first assign it to app, and then uh, not much change, we put simply the app there. Uh, and the thing is, when you, by simply assigning a function to a variable uh, that returns um, uh, JSX, uh, what you get is, is a component. And you can reuse this component as a tag. So the output of what you get here is, because we have our component app, and then we, we render it into our example node again, that we had before, is simple, simply uh, like this. You have the body, you have the, the uh, diff with the example ID, and then you, our app starts exactly where because we, we saw that the app is just a paragraph tag and with the hello world inside it. And uh, then you can see it, it directly gets rendered in there. And that's the, the absolute effect of, of what's happening. Of course, uh, there's the virtual DOM in between, and it will render to the virtual DOM first, and then it will identify is the, is the, uh, is the virtual DOM different from the real DOM, and then it will ap apply these changes. All right. Uh, so we built our first component, our app component, pretty neat. Um, not so cool so far, but what you can do is you can create nest components. Um, uh, and here I want to get right into how we can uh, render dynamic content. Uh, for example, here we have to we create our profile component. And we take uh, as parameters, um, uh, the first argument of, of uh, or the first parameter of, of a um, React component is always uh, the, the props. And in this case, we deconstruct them right away. Uh, and we expect an avatar and we name, and the avatar is used as the, uh, the source URI for the image. And the name is directly rendered into span. By the way, here we see the first time curl braces. That's when you want to render dynamic content or, or things that you get uh, passed from uh, uh, past parameters directly in your, in your templates. So you can see we uh, it's straightforward templating language. Uh, we rendered the name in there and, and uh, for, for the source URL we use the avatar the platform. Um, sure. Why is the avatar not in the code? Uh, because it's not needed. That's just some uh, JSX specifics. Um, because yeah, uh, it's just best practice that when you when you pass it, because the avatar itself is a string, and you will uh, uh, understand it as this, and, and always render it into into quotes, so you don't need it. But yeah, it, it looks weird in the beginning, but you kind of get used to it. And I, I actually don't know if you actually can have the quotes there. I think it should work too, but uh, I don't use it anymore like this. So yeah. basically, you have something like JSON in there. So you can use quotes if, if you do a uh, uh, key and value. Yeah. But if, if you only have this, I, I think it will be interpreted just as a string. So you will have the string avatar. So yeah. That won't be a valid URL. What do you mean? Why? Yeah, why? If, if you put the quotes there, yeah. it could be interpreted as a string because you don't have the colon and value. Ah, yeah. so um. But you, you don't have the, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I can answer it, but in this case, you also don't have the quotes in, the, in here, because you only render the name itself. Yeah. Uh. Does that answer it? Yeah, but, but, so this is now a variable, which yeah. is a string, so it, it gets revolved. But if you put the quotes around it, then it just, uh, it's just interpreted as a string. But you can also oh, yeah. write like a, okay. a key total value, and then you can optionally have the key in a uh, 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 quote. That, that could be. Yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but could be okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right. So we what we did here is we, we created our first profile component, uh, which now takes uh, parameters, 
uh, the, uh, for the property suite, we take the avatar and the name, and then we can use it uh, again in our JSX code itself. And then we can do nesting. We can simply create our own components and use it in our HTML, and um, that's pretty neat because then you can create your own structure, your own uh, uh, structure of, of like how the application looks like. And you can simply nest things as you want. You can have a, have a page, and in the page you have like a header, and the header is something you created by yourself, and it probably takes uh, as parameters links for, for the navigation, uh, and things like that. And that makes it really composable, um, because you, you can simply nest things and take them out and, and reuse them as you, as you like. Um, yeah, and so what you can see here is we, we import the profile component, we, and then, um, as you can see here, is, uh, it's basically a profile.js file. Um, that's our whole component. Of course, we have to export it. I didn't do that here. Uh, I simply forgot. Um, then we can uh, import the uh, profile and we can use it uh, as a component. And here, uh, I, I told you before that we the properties are passed down as first argument. And uh, for the profile, we expect an avatar and the name. And that's what we pass down to the component. And um, the whole thing again is in an app component. So we return, um, we have this app. Uh, again, we return it and then we um, we render the whole app into uh, our index HTML. And that's the outcome. So when you think about, we have um, we have the body again. We have ID example, uh, our standard. Index HTML as before, and that's where the app starts. When you look at it, uh, you have the app is just a div with hello world and a profile in it. And uh, what happens is when it's rendered, um, you have a div for the app, and then you have hello world, and then again you have the profile in it. With, but the profile, because it's a component that we constructed, is again uh, the whole construction of the rendering of the profile. Because we passed um, uh, the path for test PNG, uh, the URI for test PNG, uh, as an avatar, and Nick is name, it gets rendered uh, into a component like this. And that makes it, as I said, really composable, and, and um, you can nest things as you like. And that's pretty neat. Um, to be honest, so far, what, I, what you have seen right now is, um, is, is actually a pretty new concept, um, which is called stateless function components. Uh, because what you see here, in, uh, when, when you have these functions and you just pass down properties, uh, like in this profile component, you can't have state of the component itself. Um, there's another thing in React, uh, there's a component class, or even a helper function, which is called create class. Um, and with this you could create state, uh, stateful components, but I um, highly recommend to not to, because let that do uh, uh, Redux, Flux, or whatever you use for state management. And, um, or if you have a special case, um, then you might uh, leverage it, but especially when, when starting out, uh, you might find it way easier to, to use stateless function components, and that's actually uh, uh, also the recommendation by Facebook and all the, um, the people who develop React. And uh, I want to show you why I recommend this and, and why it's actually really useful. And then I want to uh, go a little bit into the, the traits of functional programming, because with functional programming, uh, what you have is you avoid um, changing state, um, you avoid mutable data, and uh, one really important trait of a, a functional programming is that when you call a function with uh, certain arguments, it will always return the same result. Um, if it would return uh, because of some external uh, um, influence a different result, uh, then you have uh, something what you call the side effect. But uh, if it's really pure functional programming, the function will always return the same thing. And if you look at stateless function components, they actually have the same, uh, same uh, traits because they, have, they avoid changing state. Um, in this case, you, you, you actually don't even have state um, that you can change. Uh, uh, we avoid mutable data while you could, um, because of JavaScript, why you could 
uh, change the properties that you get. Uh, React is designed in a way that you're actually not allowed or it will not propagate up to the parent because it's a copy, it's a deep copy of the, uh, the properties are deep copies of uh, uh, what gets passed down. Um, and second of all, um, if you have that, um, if you don't have state and, and you can change the properties, uh, then you have the same effect as in functional programming. Uh, whenever you call, when you create a component and you, um, you call it with the same properties, it will return the same result. And that's really, really important um, because um, these things get predictable. And that makes it really, uh, especially when you have a larger code base and you have multiple people working on it, it's really important that the code is easy to understand and easy to test. Because if it's not easy to test, people will bail out and simply test, don't test things. Um, that's common common behavior, so if you make it really predictable, um, it becomes easy to understand, easy to test. And that's really nice because what we, if you just use stateless functional uh, function components, um, you can basically build your whole UI based on a data model, um, and it will always behave the same. And it's easy to understand, you don't have to uh, uh, think a lot about side effects, uh, and I find that really powerful, and I hope that this should be in this state. Like, really mind blown. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, of course, you might wonder okay, can we have, uh, can we control flow? Yes, you can. Uh, pretty simple. Use JavaScript for that. Uh, you can combine it with JSX, you have if else statements um, in JavaScript, so you can simply assign. Uh, based on, on an argument, you can assign uh, um, um, you can assign a variable to uh, a JSX code to uh, to a variable and then pass it in in your uh, return rendering. And you can nest these things uh, as you like again because it's just like it, it constructs and that makes it really nice. Uh, so when you look at this, when you have this profile with an online indicator, so if the user is online. Um, the span, there's a span which will be, um, has the content green and if the user is offline um, so that the parameter is, on, is online is, is uh, false then we, we make it red and so if you use this component that we constructed here like this, I provide a profile, the name is Nick and then I, I pass in the, uh, for the uh, is online uh, uh, parameter I, I simply pass in uh, false, then it will return uh, the HTML content like this with different and uh, the span is red because we decided that uh, in this case it should go to the else state. Uh, of course you can also do looping. Um, if I have friends list, uh, I get data, I simply can map over, uh, um, iterate over, over these friends and then return a, a return an, um, return a JSX uh, um, result again. So in this case, I, I iterate over the, the friends and then uh, return list elements. So what you have is, if you have a friends list with uh, uh, friends are Max and Tom, and then you have the friends list, you pass the friends as data to the friends, uh, you get the uh, uh, unordered list with uh, list elements here. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so far, so good. That's about React. Uh, I didn't want to make a short summary, so we don't forget. <laughs> um, what we can do with React, we can create our own components. We can nest these components as we like. Uh, we can have, uh, since uh, briefly, we have these stateless function components, which are pure. That's a function on programming. And uh, we can, can control flow via simply via JavaScript. Uh, but there's one thing missing, and that's interaction. Because when you have uh, a user, uh, users do something on your website, and you want to interact with, or you, you want to react on the, on the interaction. And so what you have is here, you basically do in your, uh, in your profile component that we had before. Uh, I just wanted for demonstration when you have a button, um, 
we can with assigning this this on click uh, parameter, uh, we can simply say do a console log. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but the question is like, okay, what to do with it? Because we have these stateless functional components. Um, so how do we change state? And that's where Redux comes in. Uh, and Redux is uh, simply a small library uh, allowing you to change, uh, to manage state in the front end. Um, and it is re it's focusing on, on this like a really minimal API and, and predictable behavior again. I'm using predictable here again, or um, I, I want to emphasize uh, uh, um, yeah, predictable here again because it's really important. If you build larger frontends, and if you have done that, it's really hard to manage at some point because um, uh, predictability, uh, or how to say, um, when you scale an application and it's unpredictable, it's really hard to deal with. I mean, you, you spend a lot of time in debugging and, and you really don't want that. And it becomes frustrating and then people bail out and you, um, it's really tough to manage. JavaScript is not the most beautiful language, so that doesn't help either. And so we need tools to, to <coughs> solve these problems. Uh, you might have heard about Flux. Flux is this uh, concept that uh, Facebook proposed to, to uh, uh, manage state within, um, within uh, for, for React, compo uh, React applications. Uh, but the thing is, what happened is um, a couple months back, uh, Facebook announced Relay. Relay is, is a library, uh, uh, pretty heavy stuff, and also requires GraphQL in your backend. Um, and so, so Flux basically evolved into two directions. For once, it's it's Relay, uh, which is I mean it's really powerful. If you have a if you have the the problems of Facebook, uh, the data problems that Facebook has, um, and fetching problems, then go with the GraphQL backend and, and choose Relay because that's really <laughs> nice. Um, if you have a REST API and if you have uh, smaller applications, uh, then uh, I mean it, it still scales really, really good, um, but probably not, uh, I mean if, if you have really huge stuff with Facebook then you're probably off better off with Relay, but uh, if not then Redux is a really good choice. So that about Flux. Uh, Flux is yeah, getting kind of outdated, so Redux is the new thing. Um, so what is Redux? So what, what does it do? Um, interestingly, interestingly, since quite some time, um, when we do web development, what we have is uh, we have stateless applications, uh, stateless uh, backend applications, and you store data in your database. So you have uh, you have one database. There's all the um, there's all the data, you, you hold state stored, and then people um, call, do a request to your website, to your web server, uh, uh, from a website, HX request, whatever. And what happens is this request comes in, it goes through the whole application. It's basically, you can imagine, it's a big function. Yeah, your whole application is just a big function, uh, if you look at it from a functional perspective. And then it changes some data um, and it returns, uh, it changes the state and then it returns you an answer. But the, the effect is that you have your previous state, which is a database, then you, a request comes in uh, and that will result in a new state. And you might not get back the complete state uh, when, you, when, you do it, when you look at it from a backend perspective. But what in the end happens is like previous state action and what the result of the whole process um, of doing a request to your server is like your state is changed. And Redux follows the same principle because what Redux does is, or what we do with Redux is we have one uh, application state or one application store where we store the whole state for a complete front-end application. And in the beginning, um, you might feel like, what? That's not a good idea. <laughs> you feel like pretty, pretty scared. Um, at least that was my first reaction, like storing everything that your application has into one object. Mm, doesn't feel so good. 
Um, if you think a little bit or a second time about it, I mean, you do that anyway, because in the end, everything you, do, you have is, is just like, um, JavaScript is one big namespace right now, and, and you do that anyway and, and have everything in, in uh, what people do is actually they clutter state all over the application in, in different controllers, in, in uh, different models, and, and so on. And um, if you try it out, it's actually not that kind of a big deal. You, of course, you need a lot of helper tools, and Redux gives you that um, uh, to, to manage the whole state in the same way. But uh, it always works out fine. And uh, you might think like, how? Um, I want to give you a little bit of an, uh, um, of an overview how that works in Redux and how, uh, how that stuff is managed. So at the core, uh, as I already mentioned, is we have the store, and that is, uh, uh, this entity is responsible for your whole state. Uh, it stores the state, and, and it's, um, uh, it manages the whole thing, and, and everything that you do is, is connected to it. And, um, what we learned already before is the beauty of React is that you have your, your application state is, you have your application state, and the UI basically just reacts or, or is a representation of your state then. And so what, what we can do with the React store or with the Redux store is we, we simply pass the data to the, your React components uh, to your rendering and it will simply render fine. That's, um, that's the most basic thing you can do. So if you do a, like just a, a, a website which is like rendering content and you want to do it in, in React and Redux, you would have a store, you initialize the store with data, a render React components and that's it. Uh, as before, we figured out, okay, people might want to do comment on something or, or change something in the application. Um, so you have interactions, like an on-click. Somebody clicks a button, I want to add it to do item, for example. Uh, and Redux has a, um, has a specific way of dealing that, with that, is uh, uh, what we have is uh, action creators, uh, which allows us to create such actions, and we we'll get that I will explain all these things in detail in a second, but I first want to get here uh, to understand the basic concept. And these action creators then dispatch the action, which goes to the store, and the store then is responsible for um, sending this previous state, or the, the existing state, with the action to redu the reducer. And the reducer is there to, the reducer is actually the code that manipulates the state. So what you have is what we have seen before, um, with this basic principle, previous state action results in new state is exactly what happens here. It's previous state plus action, then in the reducer it's transformed and it returns the new state. Sorry, uh, which of the boxes is running on the server? Uh, none of them. None of them. None, that's only front end. Yeah. Um, to give you a feeling or to, to, to give you an understanding is um, that's the point where you actually communicate with the server. But server communication in this case is, is um, uh, if you look at it from a functional perspective, is a side effect. Um, and so um, you can do the action creators, and I will show you an action creator, and then you uh, probably get a better understanding of like where, where we actually can do um, uh, these things. Um, yeah, and so we, we have like uh, state action return, uh, returns a new state. Well, what's important to mention here is um, because we, we again have this functional programming uh, in mind, we never change the existing state. Actually, it doesn't even work in, in uh, React uh, and Redux. If you change the existing state, uh, it will not result in, in a change in the UI because the way the store is designed, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, it will not dispatch or uh, it will not uh, inform the subscribers that subscribe to the store, which in this case would be the React component. So you always have to go through this cycle um, by updating the, the state properly. Uh, yeah, and then if you if you actually made a change, so if you let's say uh, somebody clicked on add to do, you have your action creator which creates your action. It gets dispatched. Uh, the reducer changes the existing state from the list of the to-dos. Uh, you have the new state with your list of to-dos with, uh, with a new to-do in it uh, that reflects in the UI and it will turn out, 
turn up in UI. Uh, pretty complex for just adding a uh, adding an, an to do item, um, I have to say. But I'm sorry, question. Yeah, sure. No, that's, that's your data. Okay. State, state, well, when we talk about state, in this case, it's always data. It could be, I mean, that could be, um, uh, if you have a to-do list application, um, it's basically your, your to-do list. If you, have, um, if you have Facebook and you want to you have a profile page, uh, that's probably your, uh, the state is uh, um, uh, consisting of like, let's say a uh, user, so you have the profile picture, the name in there, and then you have a list of new newsfeed items. Um, and so, so the state is just like any kind of, of data, however you want to structure it. Yeah, and ideally, um, you think like, okay, that turns you into superpower, but what to do with it? Yeah? It's like, okay, now I can do things, have state, manage state, all that kind of stuff and you probably break more than it actually helps. Um, so let me debunk uh, what it is because it's really not that complex. Um, uh, an action is just a JavaScript object, nothing special. Uh, the only thing that you have to have is um, uh, you have this uh, property type and that has to be something unique in your entire application. Um, yeah, and that can be, ideally you have strings, uh, it can be numbers as well, whatever you, you like to prefer, but uh, ideally it's, it's strings. Um, and then in addition, uh, so when we have our to-do list and uh, we want to add a to-do, uh, let's say call mom, then you can add the text and you can have, um, so only required is type, anything else, uh, what, what you add, want to add to the action is up to you. Uh, you can have an action which is just the type, um, uh, which makes sense, for example, if you fetch data from the server, you dispatch an action, I'm fetching uh, 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 the user data, uh, there's probably not much data to add to that action. Uh, then you have just an action with, with, uh, with no data in it, and if you want to add a to-do, you probably want to have the text of the to-do itself. Uh, but yeah. Action is just a communication or a helpful communication and is an object with the type and additional data. Um, the action creators that we mentioned before uh, that actually uh, uh, dispatch uh, the actions uh, is just helper functions. Uh, oh, in this case, I still have to use function or the function keyword. Uh, but yeah, in the end, it's like add to do. Um, in this case, in this uh, action creators, you can also uh, do things with it. So, for example, in here when we have a button and we, we want to dispatch this uh, uh, add to do, uh, what we do here is we, we, uh, we can trim uh, uh, we can trim the, the spaces uh, right here in the action creator and, and create a proper action for it. Um, so you kind of do uh, sanitizing here or what you also could do is uh, when you have add to do, uh, what might be really useful is like uh, in this case, in the action creator, you, you dispatch the API call and in the uh, callback uh, of the API call, you can trigger another action. So you, your M action creator doesn't have to exactly one action, it's just helper functions to, to um, manage the, the action flow. Uh, so you could have um, you can add to do and directly show it on the screen, uh, have an optimistic update of your, your, your UI, and then uh, you do in the action creator also fetch uh, or make the post call to, to create the to do, uh, and then in the, in the callback you have um, you have another action created. It's like add to do uh, server success, uh, and then you could show additional. Uh, information to the user that this is actually synced or you don't want to show that but in case of an error uh, you could inf uh, take out the action or the to do item again and things like that. That really depends on your application and, and your business logic. Short, short question, is there some sort of centralized event reg registry? Because if I uh, have, I don't know, 20 buttons to add to do, split over 20 files. Yeah. Um, 
the idea is that, that these things is, I mean, it's not explicit, that you, you uh, um, um, it will come, uh, it will explain itself when it comes to reducers, but uh, yes and no. I mean, ideally you do that, you have one way of doing it, but that's up to you, because you could, um, uh, the only thing that, that is, is uh, required is to have a type, and then there could be anything, yeah? And if people mess up, they could have they could add uh, uh, two different actions uh, with the same type, and then you pretty it gets messy, and you you, you have to. So, so the key to this is, um, uh, or there's, there's strategies. What I do is, for example, I create a file constants, and then I put all my action types in there, and then you have this implicit um, uh, uniqueness, and I only import from this constants file, and then I use this one. Does that make sense? I I'm I more meant like uh, you have twenty different buttons. Like uh, yeah. you, you add this, the, the names of the callbacks directly in the user interface. If I change my constant, okay, I change it in one place, yeah. but I have to search up all the places where I used it. And keeping track of that is something that I would rather avoid. Um, which constant? Mm. No, I mean you have you have one file that's called constant, okay. like. Uh, yeah. All the functions constant and so on. Yeah. In my user interface, I have uh, 20 times the same callback in actions JS, in profile JS, okay. in avatar JS. How, how do I track that? Normally, I would ah, have okay. a centralized array or object that says this user interface object has these callbacks attached and so on. Okay, no, there's no centralized place. I mean, you, you could help, you could write yourself help of functions, but in the end, if you, if you have the same. Um, Action creator called from different uh, spots in your AI. Yes, you, you would go, need to go and and, um, and look for all of them and then uh, uh, refactor it. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious for feedback. So maybe if there's improvement, then. Yeah. Um, but how, how do you do that with the UI then? It's like I mean. Um, you, you define it in an array. Where, uh, how is it connected? And the UI. To maybe them? you have some some uh, ID and callback storage. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I've never written something with uh, with. How is it called? React. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was trying to go through flux or flux to relay whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, uh, interesting question. Maybe we can discuss it later on because I'm curious uh, about strategies, how to avoid that. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, action creators. So, as we've seen, actions are simply objects. Action creators are just help functions. That's just a concept. Um, of course, what you could do is you could directly dispatch the uh, the action object. But it's it's more like use this concept and really help you to organize your code. Um, uh, what we haven't covered yet is the reducers that actually manipulate the data. Uh, and if you look at the reducer here, is uh, then they react. Uh, so it's again simply plain JavaScript code. Um, you create a function. Uh, it takes an initial state. In this case, it's a my state is a to-do list because I have a to-do list app. Um, and uh, when I don't provide any state, or the, the store doesn't provide any state, my initial state is an empty array. Um, and then we have a switch case statement based on the action type we do things. And in this case, we return uh, the existing state uh, and append a, uh, append a new to-do. And the to-do item is an object again. Um, with the text, we take the text from the action. As we, as we remember before the... Um, the action here at text, and then we can take this uh, text and, and uh, add it to the array, complete it as false. Um, yeah, if we don't have any match, we simply return the old state. Um, actually, that, yeah, that won't have any effect. Um, so, reducer is simply just uh, get data, uh, get the initial state, we figure out which action it is, and based on that action with the data, we return a new state. Uh, store is the last part uh, of these um, of, of Redux or uh, the components in Redux, and it's uh, straightforward. It's just like uh, you can subscribe to a store, so whenever something changes in the store, you will 
uh, and we get notified in the callback. Uh, and then you can uh, dispatch new actions on the store, and, and this will call the. So uh, you, you create a, uh, you initialize the store with your reducers. Uh, there are strategies for, uh, for combining reducers, but I won't go into that right now. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then you, you, yeah, you initialize your store with your reducers, and then you can simply have describe and dispatch. Um, uh, so I can synchronized event pass. Uh, yeah, and in this case we we uh, add, have our action creator to do as we saw before and, and we uh, pass in the text. So we go back there again. So here we have the we create define our function add to do, we pass in the text and that creates the uh, the action which is actually passed down passed through the store to the reducer and then changes the state, gets back um, and then in the end, uh, uh, what you have, uh, you have a callback, um, and then from the from the store you can fetch the state again. Slowly, uh, we get to a point where everything connects. Um, so we get back to to React now. Uh, here we have the React DOM render again. Um, there's a bit of uh, uh, well, what we actually do here is uh, to to have pass down the, the state to all our React components, our whole React tree, is we, we provide the store to the provider. So we create our store here with our reducer again, um, uh, have the provider and wrap our whole application into that uh, provider and that will pass all the, the state as properties down to, to the application. Um, and let's look at the application because it also has to change a little bit compared to what we had before. The only thing that that, um, uh, that changes that we import from React Redux, um, which is the official library, uh, how to connect React with Re Redux, um, uh, we simply wrap our uh, existing function, uh, stateless function component, uh, we wrap it in a connect, and that allows you, uh, what it gives us, or what it does is that uh, it basically automatically provides the, the properties um, dispatch and state and then we can use the state to render different things and the dispatch is used then to as you have seen before dispatch is used with the store to uh, dispatch changes in the, in the uh, model and um, quick summary uh, so Redux allows to manage the state. Uh, React is there for for uh, rendering or uh, um, mapping your your data, state data to uh, to the UI, and it follows a simple principle: uh, your previous state uh, with an action, you return your state. And then you might ask, why all that effort? Uh, and um, the thing is that always becomes it, everything becomes really, really uh, um, uh, same because you can easily follow the code and, and it is simply predictable and it's all synchronous. There's no asynchronous pass in there. Um, and the uh, uh, second thing is, which is really, really helpful for, for front-end development, <laughs> is that you it allows you to, to have something like time travel. Uh, and for this, I will show you a demo. So what we have here is we have a to-do app. Um, pretty straightforward. We can enter, let's call mom again. Uh, what happens is that we have a debug panel uh, that also comes with three dots. Uh, I haven't explained that and I won't go into it because it's um, or into the code. Um, what you just have to know is you can just plug it in and it works out of the box. Uh, but the really nice thing is um, that it tracks uh, because the store you can it it or um, uh, the debug panel hooks into the store and it allows you to uh, to keep track of what's actually happening in your application because we just have actions which is something that you um, uh, just simple uh, JavaScript objects and then you can lock them 
and then you uh, and then you have state. And so what you can see is when we added the to do call mom, we have the action, um, which is of a type of add to do. Um, there was data attached to it, which is call mom, and then you have we changed the complete state. Um, in this case, the state was consisting of an object uh, um, to do or an array uh, to do. So and then you have uh, in here we have two items. Uh, one is call mom, and uh, the other one is use readout, which was already there. And then we can keep track of things. So we can uh, let me do here. Let's say okay, we learned about readout. Um, you see again new action tracked. Um, let's say uh, create the test, uh, and then we see another action popping up. The beauty of it is uh, because it's all functional and it's only based on state, and you apply things that you can simply do enable time travel. So we can simply go back in time by just disabling our actions. And I think that's really, really nice because what you can do then is uh, you have interactions or you have things, you know, your code, you do things in your UI, you change things, and then you just let them replay. And you, so in here, I just do the same action again. Uh, I mark this to do. I actually can leave that out if I want to uh, figure uh, how my UI reacts to different state applications uh, based if I have things and not. So this mark to do call mom, I just leave out and I enable this again. And then I can go through different things. Yeah? And ah, it was actually mark to do of, of use Redux. Yeah? But it's really, really nice because it, it, it gives you a really nice interface because of. Um, uh, of redoing things and 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 uh, it all becomes same because it in the end is always just you have an action and state changed and that's the new state and that's pretty um, if you write front end applications with like five to ten people uh, and all mess with your JavaScript uh, and you follow these patterns then uh, JavaScript becomes more fun again and. Yeah, that's why I'm really, uh, why I really, really enjoy that stuff, and why I think it's super, super useful to use. Um, yeah. Okay. As we mentioned, uh, reusable components. Uh, everything becomes predictable because we are very functional. Uh, it allows us to have features like time travel. It's super easy. Um, there's applications that have like pixel editors and. The whole time traveling code there is at like 20 lines of code, and it works. Um, and it's super performant and lightweight. Um, I think React plus um, uh, plus Redux is half the size of, of your whole Angular, uh, um, the whole Angular uh, library. And really saying, uh, you might ask, is this production ready? Should I really use that? Is it a good idea to use a React? Uh, definitely, I mean Facebook, you actually can go to Facebook and, and type in uh, window.react and you see the React version there and they actually use the, uh, while the official version is like 0.14 they use already the 0.15 so React, uh, Facebook is always on the master they, they're really serious about this um, Firefox, the Firefox dev tools um, are built in React um, uh, at least the, the newest version uh, Airbnb is using React and many, many more. Uh, and all because uh, you want to have, the, I mean, they have huge applications and they, they really were really frustrated people with, um, with uh, managing uh, the applications, the front end applications, the front end architectures. And React helps them to keep safe. And uh, for Redux, uh, Redux as well, uh, used by Firefox now. Uh, so the, the Firefox dev tools. The newest version is uh, it's used with uh, it's built with Redux, uh, Docker for the for the UI uses Redux. Um, it's actually quite fun because when I when I look for who, who uses Redux, there's uh, student form applications um, of the Technical University of Vienna are built with uh, Redux, MetaMark, many many more, and even the creators of Flux um, uh, looked at it and they're like, okay, that's definitely we we love. Uh, uh, what it's doing and how it's going. And um, to be honest, 
I mean, the whole ideas and, and this, especially this whole thing, um, uh, I'm not sure if you, if it's, uh, if I really brought it, uh, uh, could, could uh, explain it in a way that it's easy to understand because um, I think it's not simple. <laughs> but the thing is, if you have that and if you got bought into that and you, you understood that, it really makes your, your life for, for uh, front-end development easier. Go ahead. Um, I understand the point of using something analogous to functional programming here to actually have predictability, but all of your examples were just a front-end example. So going back to the earlier question, yeah. on that click, the action creator, now I gotta go to the back end and fetch some data. So that happens and you have another action on the front end to change the state? Yes, exactly. Okay, so, I mean, I don't know whether you can go to that slide, there was a couple slides before Barack Obama, but. <laughs> um, the one, uh, the one the action creator, right? Yeah, this one. yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it was further on. It was further, it was, it was on, it was the on click. It was past us. Um, Maybe this one? I think it was your last code. So, yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. So, so now you're going to have more code actually within the JavaScript that actually goes to the back end, or you're going to have it as a completely different forked. Where are you going to go to the back end, and when are you going to get the results in the back end, and how does it get back into the store that something is now changed on the screen? Um, let me, okay, share code right here. Yeah, that's, let me try. <laughs> um, no, i show it to you. Of that connection. Um, uh, give me a second. So what you do is you, you have this, I mean, the action creator is just a function and you can do anything you want in there. And what you can also do with the action creator, you can pass in the dispatch. And what you do is like, uh, I mean, you, you don't actually, when you call the action creator, you don't have to, to return an action right away if you don't dispatch it. So your action creator could actually um, take in, a, uh, take in a, the information that, hey, there's a new, Added to do, and if you really want to wait on the server, you don't dispatch an action. I don't want to wait on the okay, server. Okay, then, then I, you. I, I want to be asynchronous. I want to display, you yeah. know, translating, and then I want to go get the translation. I want to come back and I want to display okay. on the screen. Okay. Uh, then you have an action which is like uh, translate, uh, an action creator, which is just a function. And what you do is you immediately you pass in the dispatch. Uh -huh. You. Um, you start the, uh, the call, the, the API call, uh, which is asynchronous, and in the callback you say, okay, dispatch an action, with, because we, you get data from the server, and you say dispatch an action uh, with the data, uh, and the action name is probably like translation response, uh, or uh, translation received. Yeah? And then right away, um, what's synchronous, you return, uh, or you, you, you dispatch another action, um, which is called translation starting, uh, uh, tr uh, requesting translation, something like that. Yeah, and then so your store can actually uh, um, can respond to uh, translation starting right away. And if you uh, you might in your state you have an you have a um, uh, let's say a boolean that describes like is trans uh, trans translation is loading or not, true false, is translating. And then your you whole React UI uh, transpon a response to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then then, when it, and when it comes back, then and you, when it, you go through another loop. Exactly, yeah. It always goes through this whole loop. Whenever you, you dispatch an action, it goes through the whole loop again. So when you get the callback result, you'll go through that loop again. On the Absolutely, loop. yeah. Exactly. And, but the beauty is that um, when you apply the whole state again to uh, your whole React app, uh, but it doesn't matter because it's React itself and the virtual DOM is so performant that you never notice. I mean, yes, um, and the 
there we go a little bit deeper, but if you actually, I mean, the, the problem with JavaScript is um, that you, you have a really hard time comparing objects because uh, the comparison is reference-based. Uh, and so if you, if you use immutable data structures, which I do, but I didn't want to, to uh, add another layer of complexity here, so I only use immutable JavaScript data structures, um, then you actually can do reference comparison. Uh, uh, yeah, then you can do compare, yeah, reference comparison and these immutable data structures are even faster and then you can bail out early individual DOM and it becomes super performant. And um, yeah, that's the, that's the whole idea behind it. Um, so yeah, and, and not only use React, uh, which, but React anyway. If you, it, you're still pretty good when, when using plain JavaScript objects because it's just, it, in the end it's string comparisons, the virtual DOM, the string comparisons, and that in every uh, uh, VM, that's super, super fast. So you can render a big website, no problem. Still very fast. Um, and then finally, uh, if you're interested in that, we have a Vienna React Meetup. Um, and that's definitely a really good place to meet other people and, and ask them uh, <laughs> about details. And we even had like, I mean, I'm super proud of that. We had speakers from Facebook in Vienna. Um, talked about really crazy stuff, like they write, they analyze JavaScript on an EST level to make commits uh, or to, to do refactorings, write code to do refactorings and then make commits with 50,000 lines of uh, code chains, it's really weird stuff, I would never like to be a reviewer of that, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> and um, yeah, so come to our next uh, uh, Vienna React Meetup uh, next time. Uh, someone from Rentastic and developer from Rentastic will tell about uh, React Native, um, how to use React uh, with a mobile application. And yeah, that's it so far. Uh, party time. <laughs> and um, thank you very much for listening.